Well, I may not be a seat warmer, but I promise you, I get elected governor, I'll be a seat kicker. I promise you that for certain. You can count on that. And as far as those of you who are running for office, I know there's a number of you here. Guys, there's another thing it takes besides courage, insanity, and a really big dose of it. So guys, my condolences. No, thank you. Thank you so much for all of you. Chuck is a good, good friend. And he really is the kind of guy, and I know that those of you in the Tulsa area, you know this. He's the kind of guy that is not ashamed to tell you what he believes, and he's not ashamed to stand on it. So Chuck, man, thank you for doing the work. Thank you for everything that you have done and for standing up for truth. I, I appreciate it. And for keeping the governor from raising our taxes by 500,000 to fill, I mean 500 million, to fill a $215 million hole. Now, I don't know, even with uh, Common Core math, I can figure that's too much, right? So, thanks for holding the line. Well, he's right about the single issue topic. Uh, you know, we are being accused of the very same thing. Now, if you go to my website, if you go to my Facebook, if you read our materials, you know that that's only one of the things we're talking about. We're talking about all kinds of things. We're talking about how to shrink bloated government. We're talking about theft through overtaxation. We're talking about strangling the private sector economy by overregulation. We're talking about auditing this thing for the first real time, bringing out an outside auditor who will literally perform a hard audit, you know, we were one of the first ones talking about that. And we're also talking about restoring proper government. So yeah, other than those things, we're just a single issue campaign, right? But you see, the reason why they do this is because they always want to marginalize those that they can't defeat rhetorically. See, if they don't have winning ideas, then they just have to simply resort to name-calling and attacking a person's reputation. Now, it's not name-calling to speak the truth about someone. I'm going to do a little bit of that today. But what they are saying is not true. And the fact that they are saying it ought to tell all of us something. We are getting under their skin. Isn't that fun? Yes. Yes. See, they would be ignoring us if our message wasn't resonating. To prove it to you, just this Thursday, Lieutenant Governor Todd Lamb, who I've always considered a friend of mine, was on the Pat Campbell Show. He emphasized nine different times how pro-life he is. Nine times. Now, do you honestly think he would have been doing that if we weren't in this race? Of course not. Most Republican politicians these days just check that pro-life box and go right on. So, yes, we're about all kinds of things. But like Chuck just said, if there is one thing that I think is a litmus test for everything else, it's our position on life. And especially in our era, on the lives of the unborn. Here's what I believe. Here's what I believe. I believe that a culture that is capable of murdering the most innocent among us, even when they are pre-born, is capable of any other kind of evil. All it will take is just the proper circumstances and they would be just as willing to murder senior citizens. They'd be just as willing to murder those who have some type of uh, mental challenges or physical challenges or, uh, let's say, uh, held political beliefs that are not popular to them. I mean, friends, if you will murder pre-born babies, won't you do just about anything else? Certainly you will. So in my mind, you will never be able to have a moral culture as long as you're murdering unborn babies. So no, 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 uh, no surprise then that our government steals from us in overtaxation 
and then misuses the money? The Department of Health comes to mind immediately. $30 million. How do you mishandle $30 million? We're going to find that it's a lot more than that across the agencies. Well, you see, a government that won't correct the murder of the unborn surely isn't going to correct that. And there's just a prime example. So, we are here today, not because this is all we are about, but friends, we are here today to say loud and strong in good numbers that if we can't fix this, does it really even matter what else we fix? It really doesn't. Because I promise you, in a culture where the lives of those little unborn babies are vulnerable, so is yours. All you have to do is just get on the wrong side long enough. So, we are here unashamedly to say, yes, abortion needs to end. Now, there are many other things that we need to take care of, and there are many other challenges. But we are here today to focus on that particular issue because as far as I'm concerned, even if you gain the whole world, but in the process lose your soul, you've gained nothing. So we could have the best economy in this union. We could gold plate not just Bricktown in Oklahoma City. We could gold brick every town in Oklahoma. We could do all of these things. But if we lose our souls in the process... Not only have we not accomplished anything, we've lost everything. Because there is an accounting coming. I believe that with all of my heart. So with those things in mind, I want to thank you for caring enough to be here. It's not just me who is speaking today. You are speaking. You are speaking loud and clear. A good number of you were over at the... Uh, I, I refuse to call it a clinic, over at the Killing Center. And you were helping us. And I made it clear to you that you were more than props. You were preachers. You were speaking out by being there. By being here, you are speaking loudly. And let me assure you, it unnerves the establishment. You know what they have to do to have a crowd this size? They have to hire some well-known celebrity or performer. Now granted, they hire some top ten performer and they can have a huge attendance at a concert and then either right before it or somewhere in the deal, in a little break, they'll run up there and say, hey, I'm so-and-so and I'm running for this. And then everybody says, okay, great, now let's hear some more songs. But a kind of group like this terrifies them because they can't do this. That's not because we're better. It's not because I'm better. It's because our ideas are. And they're not our ideas. They're God's. They're God's ideas. Someone that our founders and framers were not only unashamed to mention, but actually feared enough to use as the basis by which they derived their understanding of government. So I'm going to talk just a little bit today to you about this issue at hand, making an abortion-free state. That's a huge claim. How do we get there? Will it be easy? No, of course not. Will all of hell come against us? Yes, it already is. And it will not get better or easier. I'm not trying to be a doomsday prophet here, but it's going to get harder. Because now we are assaulting the very kingpin, the very cornerstone of progressivism. Because they have staked everything on the ability to devalue human life. And once you do that, you can do anything. So with that in mind, brothers and sisters, we have been treating the murder of babies in the womb as a political issue in Oklahoma for the past, well, Monday, 45 years years. We've been using the legalized practice of what many would call child sacrifice to get votes, raise funds, build our own little kingdoms. Whether knowingly or not, we've been drawing out the battle against abortion for the sake of building our own careers. 
We've been delaying the abolition of this great evil with a never-ending string of small, incremental pro-life regulations, like not allowing a pre-born baby to be murdered after 20 weeks. I have to ask, how in the world do we ever fall for this incremental approach to ending abortion in the first place? And what do we have to show for all of those small pro-life victories we've won over the past 45 years? What do we have to show? 60 million dead babies and counting. In Oklahoma, probably some 200,000 dead babies. 15 to 20 every business day that we know of. This pro-life incremental strategy makes a mockery of God, His Word, and human life. Let me illustrate it like this. We all believe that rape is, an, is a, a reprehensible evil, right? Now a lot of people say, well, you can't make that comparison. How could you possibly compare abortion to rape? Okay, abortion's worse. Because it's actually, actually the taking of life as reprehensible as we all believe rape is. So what if, rather than abolishing rape altogether in the past, it had been suggested that we abolish rape incrementally? Would any Christian in their right mind have suggested or agreed to that? Of course not. Imagine a candidate running for office who said, When I am elected, I will work to end the rape of women 20 years and older. Just imagine that. We would teach that moron a lesson he'd never forget, right? That's exactly what we would do. And so we are justifiably outraged when someone would suggest that legalizing the rape of women under uh, the age of 20. So how can we not be equally outraged at the suggestion that we allow the murder of preborn babies under the age of 20 weeks? in order to save those older than 20 weeks. Why not just end them all? How about that? If abortion is wrong, if abortion is wrong after 20 weeks, it's wrong before 20 weeks. It's simply wrong. If we can object so strongly to incrementally limiting rape, how can we support an incremental approach to ending abortion? This is how far we have fallen, friends. Without saying it, many Christians have become that which we claim to abhor, moral relativists. When we accepted the notion that abortion is a political issue resolved by the courts, we abdicated our right to stop its evil practice. So now we congratulate ourselves for winning pro-life victories from time to time that, in the end, accomplish little to nothing. We hand out roses to legislators and assure them that we are winning the fight when we all know in our hearts that we are not. We rally people to the cause of regulating abortion as health care instead of criminalizing it as murder. That is not the definition of winning in my book. I don't call that winning. And the awful truth is that strategy is the very reason we are losing. Friends, we have not failed to be pro-life enough in Oklahoma. We have passed lots of pro-life legislation. We've repeatedly elected a majority of pro-lifers to represent us in our state legislature. We've elected pro-life governors, pro-life mayors. We have over 7,000 pro-life churches in our state. We've built over 45 pro-life crisis pregnancy centers. We have celebrated how pro-life we are since the very first Rose Day ceremony in 1991. Friends, we definitely have not failed to be pro-life here in Oklahoma. But what we have failed to be is fully Christian. That is what we have failed to be. Now let me explain. Let me explain because I know that that steps on toes. I understand that. Let me explain. Every child murdered by abortion is created in the image of God. That child is every bit as human as you or I. 
They possess the same God-given right to life as you do or I do. Think about it. Every child murdered by abortion is your neighbor. Your neighbor. My neighbor. Now, according to Jesus, God's law can be summed up with two commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. What's the second one? Love your neighbor as yourself. Every abortion is a direct violation of these two great commandments. Every abortion. Now, in good old Oklahoma here, we allow the murder of some 5,500 babies every year with pro-life laws in the books telling people where and when they can murder their babies and designating who can murder them. And every year at the Rose Day ceremony, we congratulate those who possess the power to end this great evil, but who actually have been perpetrating it or perpetuating it by rallying the people to regulate the killing rather than rallying the people to abolish it. Friends, I say again, we have not failed to be pro-life in Oklahoma. We have failed to be fully Christian. The Word of God does not command us to moderate justice. It doesn't command us to reduce the killing. It doesn't command us to pass laws which reduce the fatherless prey or to abandon the least of these to destruction, or to save those who are simply easier to save. No, instead, Scripture demands that we do good and condemn those who call evil good and good evil. Friends, we have not failed to be pro-life. We have failed to be abolitionists. Those who run the large pro-life organizations in our state who put together large pro-life rallies and who passionately support candidates who profess to be born, excuse me, profess to be pro-life are all refusing to support me and my call to abolish abortion. And they call it fanciful dreaming or just plain unconstitutional. Now friends, I want you to hear me very carefully. If the U.S. Constitution actually protects the killing of the unborn, then we are duty-bound under God to be unconstitutional. Right. We are duty-bound. If the Constitution actually protects the murder of the unborn, we are duty-bound to be unconstitutional. Now what makes what makes this situation even more disappointing is pro-life leaders in our state are not only rallying their people, are not only not rallying, excuse me, their people to our cause, but are actually rallying Christians to support our opponents who will do nothing to end abortion. Right now they are organizing yet another Rose Day and hoping that they can divert people from hearing our message. For some very misguided reason that, to be honest with you, I cannot understand, they refuse to move beyond regulating abortion and to stand up together with one voice and abolish human abortion in Oklahoma once and for all. They just simply refuse to do that. We don't need more roses. We don't, do not need more pro-life platitudes and promises. Let me tell you what we need. We need justice to flow down like a river onto our state. We need and must demand for justice to flow down on this state. No more platitudes, no more slogans, no more empty promises. Now taking roses to the Capitol in a few days may make us feel good and make us think we're accomplishing something and taking a stand. But it's anything but that. I believe it's what the Old Testament prophets called preaching peace, peace, when there is no peace. We cannot cover up what I believe is our modern day holocaust by exaggerating the success of our pro-life efforts that have really only kept abortion legal. 
This is a morally bankrupt idea, friends. One for which I, and those of you who know me, one for which I have personally repented to a holy God of having practice. Now, I've always been pro-life, but I wasn't an abolitionist. At least, I didn't know I was. I may have been and just didn't know it. But I was unknowingly, unintentionally part of the problem. I'm angry at myself, to be honest with you, that I didn't figure this out before, but I just didn't. But I'm also thankful that I serve a merciful and grace-giving God, and I am forgiven. I am forgiven. Let me also stop right here and say that for anyone who's ever been a part of an abortion in any way, whether you were the mother, the father, the physician, or a family member or friend who encouraged it, I don't want you to think that we don't care. It's not just these pre-born babies that we care about. We care about you. Some of you are probably battling with guilt. I want you to know there is hope. There is refuge. There is forgiveness in Jesus Christ. Amen. And I encourage you to run to His grace. Amen. Church, I tell you. That's right. It's okay. Church, I tell you that this is our shining moment. This is our moment to stand up and actually do something. This is our moment to stand up and be the church and stand beside these women who are facing some unplanned, maybe unwanted pregnancy and are terrified. And they've not spent most of them hours deliberating and thinking about the, the uh, philosophical ramifications of abortion. They're terrified. They don't know what they're going to do. And they're lied to by the establishment. And they're pressured by others and many times even against their own inner convictions they carry it out. But they probably wouldn't if the church would stand up and minister to them and instead of pointing a finger of accusation would walk up to them with outstretched arms. I have completely and utterly abandoned the notion that some silly legislature or corrupt state or federal Supreme Court has the authority to even determine whether or not a preborn baby can legally be scalded to death or ripped limb from limb by a murderer who calls himself a doctor. God says it is murder and that's the way it is. God says clearly that He hates hands that shed innocent blood. Now I want you to know that I'm going to fight this evil with all of the strength God gives me until my dying breath. And I also want you to know that this isn't a stunt. I want you to know that I am far more committed to winning the debate than I am to winning the election. So I want you to know that right now. The debate means more to me than the election itself. And we're running to win. But what I really want to win is the debate. I want to see justice return. You do too. I'm convinced that with God's help, together, we can prevail. I believe that. I have to believe that. I cannot resign myself to a culture that is as hard-hearted as the one that we seem to be right now. Abortion's all murder. We all know it. We are wrong to call abortion anything other than the murder of a human being. We are wrong to treat it as anything other than murder. And we are right to immediately abolish it, regardless of what the Oklahoma or the U.S. Supreme Courts have to say about it. Now, with all due respect, Lieutenant Governor Todd Lamb, Mayor Mick Cornett, Auditor Gary Jones, businessman Kevin Stitt, and Attorney Gary Richardson, they all talk about how pro-life they are. I already told you that Lieutenant Governor Lamb, nine times in a 30-minute interview, re-emphasized, I'm pro-life, I'm pro-life, I'm pro-life. Hey, did you know, Pat, I'm pro-life, I'm pro-life. Well, what do you think about the economy? I'm pro-life first, and I'm a pro-life economist. I mean, just over and over and over. 
Some of these men are even saying privately that they actually believe abortion to be murder. But the big difference between them and me is that they refuse to treat it like murder, and I'm telling you, I will. If I am elected the governor of this state, I will treat it like the crime it is. When I am governor, with your help, there will never be another Rose Day ceremony. We will actually follow God's command that says, Thou shalt not murder. Abortion will be treated as murder. When I'm governor, or as God is my witness, I will publicly name all of the people opposing us, and I will re reveal them for what they really are, reprobates, who lie to you about who they really are. I'm telling you, that's what I will do with the bully pulpit as governor. There will be, understand this, there will be no, no safe quarter given during my administration on this issue. But I have to tell you, there are some that I blame even more than our political leaders for this Holocaust. In fact, I used to be one of them, as I said. I put most of the blame for this, not on our political leaders, but our spiritual leaders. Our leaders, particularly pastors, are AWOL on this issue. I've been waiting for weeks to see if Christian and pro-life leaders would step up and support us. Sadly, to this point, for the most part, all we're hearing is crickets. Now, thankfully, a few have the courage of their convictions, and some of those brave pastor soldiers are with us today. If you're a preacher or you're a pastor, would you stand right now? This is your black regiment. These, 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 these are the men. These are the men who will end this, not me. Of course, we all bear some level of guilt for this evil. But according to Scripture, leaders bear the greatest blame. Our pastors have known for the last 44, now almost 45, that abortion is murder, yet they have done little to stop it. And now that a man, me, is running for governor who says he wants to abolish abortion, these pastors are as quiet as the mice in their churches and are running for cover like roaches. Now, I don't know whether they are hypocrites, cowards, ignorant of the issue, or a little of all of the above. But I have to ask, how did so many politically correct Frady cats become the pastors of our churches. How in the world did that happen? And this, my friends, is why the church has failed so miserably in its responsibility to protect the unborn. Our spiritual leaders have failed to lead, and when they have provided some level of leadership, it has been to lead the church to believe abortion is a political issue and we can't talk about it at church. Friends, abortion is a moral issue, not a political one. And pastors, pastors must do more than hand out a few roses on Rose Day once a year and preach a sermon on Sanctity of Life Sunday. That's not being an abolitionist. That's not making a sincere attempt to end this horrible evil. And yet, for the most part, that's what the average pastor does. So I call upon all pastors, men that I would consider our spiritual generals on the battlefield, to repent like I have and join our movement. Come out of hiding. Come out of the shadows. Get out from behind this pulpit and be honest. Repent and do the right thing. Your people are begging for it. 
Let me say something to the pastors who might hear this later on through the internet or some other social media option. I travel all over the state and all over the country doing the Black Regiment presentation. Every time I have people walk up to me with tears running down their faces and here's what they ask me, what can I do to get my pastor to talk like this and to engage? But to my knowledge, I have never had a pastor come up to me with tears running down his face saying, Dan, what must I do to get my church to engage? It's always the people, not the pastors. So if you are a pastor in this state and my abolitionist campaign scares you so much that you cannot bring yourself to stand with me and with these 5,500 babies that will be slaughtered this year, then God have mercy on you. You will answer to God for your fear of standing up for the truth. You should resign your church and stop calling yourself God's spokesman. And you understand that I say that as a full-time pastor. I've been a pastor since I was 24 and I'm 58. So I'm saying that as a pastor. Now these pastors, probably more than anyone else, know what God says about this. Proverbs 6, 17. God says, I hate hands that shed innocent blood. Proverbs 24, 11, God says, deliver those who are led toward death and hold back those stumbling to the slaughter. Proverbs 3.27 Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in the power of your hand to do so. They say, well, Dan, I don't know if we could ever prevail. Well, then try! Try! What happened? What happened to the consent of the government? What happened to our rock-solid belief that government derives its power from the people? And that government operates at the consent of the governed. I can tell you what happened. The pastors and the leaders and the politicians stopped believing that. Because you see, they can't control you. They can't manipulate you. They can't deceive you. When you know that you hold the power. Not them. Now, one does not have to be an accomplished theologian to understand this. My fellow preachers, not necessarily the ones in this room because they're doing it. Their presence here proves it. But to all of my other fellow preachers who I love dearly, I beg you, man up. Grow a moral spine and stand up. Stand up now or we will lose everything. But it's not just the pastors who should stand with us. Our national and state leaders should stand with us as well. They should stop insisting that Oklahomans must obey unjust laws and unjust decisions from politically connected lawyers on the Supreme Court in Washington, D.C. and instead lead the people to stop this. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, my, my Republican competitors for governor who are running to lead our state will not do this. They say that they simply cannot stand against the Supreme Court in order to defend unborn babies. Let me back this up. Though most of these men have not really said this publicly, they've said it. Gary Jones, that I consider to be a friend, refuses to talk about abortion. He says he will leave that to the legislature. Mick Cornett says he will distinguish himself with issues other than abortion. Kevin Stitt and Lieutenant Governor Todd Lamb repeatedly, re repeatedly declare they are pro-life, but shrug off anyone who asks them what they will do to abolish abortion if they're elected. I might add that while I was in the legislature for two terms, Regardless of what he had done before I got there, Lieutenant Governor Lamb 
had numerous opportunities as the presiding officer of the Senate to defend the unborn. But to my knowledge, he did nothing. He certainly did nothing to aid the efforts I was involved in. Nothing. But like a good politician, he repeats ad nauseum how pro-life he is. Now let me tell you why he does that. Because he's probably seen polling that shows that the grassroots Oklahomans are resonating with our message. And he realizes that his fat is in the fire. And if he doesn't at least claim to be staunch pro-life, he may not have a chance. Gary Richardson, now get this, says he will support the will of the people and defy the federal government if Oklahomans legalize medical marijuana, but claims that I am encouraging lawlessness when I say we should defy the federal government to stop the killing of preborn babies. What a cowardly contradiction. How in the world can he think like that? And though I don't want to get into all the details today, I believe that we ought to offer medical cannabis to those that it can help. There are people who can be helped by that. I'm against recreational. But I'm telling you, friends, if you're willing to defy the federal government over that, and you won't defy the federal government to save lives, you're not fit for the office of governor of Oklahoma. And that's my personal opinion. Well, Mr. Richardson, hear me clearly. When it comes to abortion, I condemn the morally bankrupt Supreme Court. I condemn them with everything in me. I condemn them. You know this, the Supreme Court was morally bankrupt in 1857 when it said blacks were private property. The state of Wisconsin was right in defying them. It was morally bankrupt in 1925 when it invented the incorporation doctrine whereby it has eventually taken all power to itself and away from the states. It was mor morally bankrupt in 1944 when it sided with President Roosevelt and imprisoned American citizens of Japanese descent. It was even more morally bankrupt on, July, uh, excuse me, on January the 22nd, 1973, when it dehumanized freeborn babies and ushered in a holocaust of 60 million dead Americans. It is morally bankrupt. And the other leaders running for governor have the gall then to tell me we must submit to their unrighteous decrees like these, shame on them. Shame on them. So if you are a leader in this state who names Jesus as your savior, and you can't bring yourself to stand with me to abolish abortion, and keep another 5,500 5, babies from being slaughtered, shame on you. You will answer to God for your hypocrisy. If you're a candidate in this state who names Jesus as your savior and you mock my abolitionist position for political gain and deceive people into believing these 5,500 babies cannot be saved, shame on you. You will answer to God for your political cowardice. If you are a voter in this state who names Jesus as your savior and you can't bring yourself to support my abolitionist campaign and help save these 5,500 babies that will be slaughtered this year, shame on you. You will answer to God for your inaction and silence. Shame on you. Now, I have a bit of good news for us and a bit of bad news for them. Abolitionist candidates are rising up all across the country. And as a Christian who claims to want to honor God by obeying His commands, you as a Christian have an obligation to support and vote for these abolitionists who will attempt to end 
this senseless evil. This is what my friend and campaign volunteer Russell Hunter was saying when he posted on his Facebook, personal Facebook page last week, that it is a sin for Christians not to vote for me. I don't know if you saw that. Of course, he was immediately loved and embraced by the establishment for that statement, right? No, they attacked him. Understand, Russell was not saying that it's a sin not to vote for me, Dan Fisher. Who am I? That's not what he was saying. Here's what he was saying. Since I am the only abolitionist in this race, it is a sin for any Christian not to stand with abolition and thus with me. That's what he was saying. So, Russell, thank you for your courage. Thank you for being willing to say what we all know is true. Thank you. Now, why is this true? Because it's 100% consistent with God's Word. That's why it's true. God is watching all of us, and He sees what we're doing. And to Lieutenant Governor Todd Lamb, Oklahoma City Mayor Mick Cornett, State Auditor Gary Jones, Attorney Gary Richardson, and businessman Kevin Stitt, I say God is watching you too. He hears your rhetoric and your claims. God will not be mocked. You will answer to Him. And so will I for that matter. We all will. None of us will escape the judgment of God. To paraphrase the words of Joshua 24, Joshua said, Put away! to the Israelites, the gods, and I'll add, of the Supreme Court and the federal government, and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the Supreme Court and the federal government or God. As for me and my campaign, we will serve the Lord. How about that? We will serve the Lord. That's what we will do. Always. That's what we will do. That's what we will do. That's what we will do. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm just about done. Now they're going to call us nuts. They already are. They're going to call us, call us fanatics. They already are. They're going to call us anarchists. They already are. We're not. We may be a little nuts. <laughs> we probably are fanatics. But we're not anarchists. They're going to call us against law and order. We're not. In fact, what we're standing on is law and order. That's, that's what we are. It ought to be illegal to murder babies. Because murder is illegal to all of the other state and national Christian leaders who insist on pro-life incrementalism, I am sounding the trumpet in accordance with Ezekiel 33. You remember that's where Ezekiel says, by the hand of the Lord, you are watchmen on a wall. If you help us attempt to end this holocaust, your hands will be clean, regardless of whether we succeed. But if you do not, Heed this warning. I tell you, the blood of 5,500 babies starting in 2019 and following thereafter will be on your hands. Let me end today by painting a picture of what could be if we do the right thing. So let your mind's eye look ahead to January 2019, when I have been administered the oath of office. Can you see it? Think about it. Can you see it? Now I want you to look past that day to the day I sign the legislation that makes abortion murder in Oklahoma and treats it as such. Can you see that? Now imagine President Trump 
hearing of our efforts and publicly standing with Oklahoma and calling upon the U.S. Supreme Court to stand down. Imagine that. By the way, by the way, here's a dirty little secret. Did you know that Congress has the authority to limit the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court? And of all the other courts. So don't tell me they can't do it. Our delegation from Oklahoma, they either don't know that or don't have the guts to say it. And I don't know which it is. Imagine what we will feel on the day when all of the killing centers are closed in this state. When the silent screams are heard no more. No more. Imagine a day when women in Oklahoma who have unplanned pregnancies and previously thought their only option was to murder their child find refuge, forgiveness, hope, and help in the local church. A revived church that has become a shining light to their community. Imagine, imagine with me a day when fathers and mothers, instead of murdering their children, find forgiveness in Jesus and a deep abiding love for one another where the baby they were going to murder becomes the very object of their affection. Imagine that. Imagine the glory we will bring to God because we obeyed Proverbs 24.11 and rescued those who were being led to death. Imagine the revival that will break out in Oklahoma in the churches when the church finally acts on what it says it believes. Imagine being part of something that noble. Well, if you can imagine that, that is why I'm running. And that is why you must support this campaign. The day we imagine can happen. Let me scratch that. The day we imagine will happen if we are courageous and faithful. So here's my question to those of you in this room and to those who will view or listen to this speech later on. Will you stand with me? Can't hear you. Will you, will you stand with me? Will you stand with me? Will you stand with me? Will you stand with what is right? Will you stand with God and His Word? Will you stand? Let this whole state, let this whole union hear you right now. Will you stand? Will you stand? Will you stand? Will you stand? Yes! Because I would rather, I would rather die on my feet than live on thy knees. How about you? And here's what I want to do. I want to close my time with a prayer. Many of us in this room, certainly I, have repented of this horrible evil. And even though I didn't know it all those years I was pro-life, I was doing nothing but helping to keep this thing legal. So I'm going to lead us in a prayer. Many of you are way ahead of me on this. You've already dealt with this in your own heart. But I want us to pray a prayer of repentance. But I want it to reach beyond this room. And I want it to reach across this state. And maybe across this union. You don't know what God may be doing here. And let's pray for those who have been a part of an abortion. Who are carrying, I bet you, a terrible load of guilt. We don't want them there. 
We want them to find that there's forgiveness in life, don't we? So can I lead us in that prayer? Pray with me. Father, in Jesus' name, we come to you now. God, the, the mountain seems huge. And it's steep. The enemy seem as giants. We feel probably what those spies felt when they told Joshua, we're, we're just grasshoppers. Moses, we're just grasshoppers. Of course, Joshua and Caleb, no, we can take it because God said it. But Lord, we have to admit to you that our flesh is weak. We're weak. Father, some of us have doubted that this day could ever come. We've even doubted that someone would stand up and say these things. Some of us were unintentionally, ignorantly a part of perpetuating this evil. So God, forgive us for all of this. Forgive us for our doubts. Forgive us for our fear. Forgive us for our ignorance. Forgive us for our rebellion, our wickedness, our evil. God, forgive us. Lord, we do pray that justice would flow down on Oklahoma like a river. God, we pray that a spirit of repentance would flow across our churches. God, if the evangelical church, just the evangelical, others could join in, but if just the evangelical church in Oklahoma would repent, this would end quickly. God, I pray that you will help us to do that. God, I pray that this spirit of repentance will spread and spill out of Oklahoma onto neighboring states and across this union of states. And that God, one by one, believers will begin to say, I understand. I'm not a pro-lifer. I'm an abolitionist. And one by one, hundred by hundred, thousand by thousand, million by million, in one mighty voice, we will stand and say, God, no more. By God's power and by God's strength, we can take those giants. We can take that hill. And the church will stand up. And do what it says it believes. God, we do not necessarily pray for victory in this campaign, though that would be our goal. We pray for justice. We pray that we not just win the campaign and that we win votes, but that we win the debate, that we win the argument. God, let your truth permeate our hearts. And for those who have been a part of an abortion in any shape, form, or fashion, God, I pray that somehow, some way, through maybe some of us, your mercy and your amazing grace can be illustrated to them. And that they realize that you so loved them that you sent your only begotten Son. That if they would trust in you, they would not perish eternally, but that they would have eternal life. You're a God of life. Let your amazing grace fall down upon us like a blanket. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I 
old slave trader named John Newton. Toward the end of his life, he started to lose his mind. Couldn't remember his friends, couldn't remember much. One of his old friends came to see him in the last part of his life, and they visited for a while, and finally his friend looked at him and said, John, you don't know who I am, do you? The story goes, Newton looked at him and said, friend, there are good many things that I can't remember anymore. But there are two things that I remember. I am a great sinner. And I have a great Savior. May we remember those two things. God bless you. Thank you so much for being here today.